So this rear end extends. It goes like that. And that rear end, rear end goes down. Thank you for that expert. <laughs> That's it. Expert. Cut. <laughs> Cut and we're done. So, difference between a solid axle and a independent rear suspension car is a major difference. So this car used to be independent rear suspension and things that Joey was fighting or anybody with a independent rear suspension car fights is you don't have a solid axle all the way across. So when you take off and you got slicks on the car, because you obviously want slicks on the car when you got independent stuff like that. That way you can squat the car and plant the tire as much as possible. Through the past couple of years, we've learned quite quickly suspension setups and stuff like that. Here we go. Probably could have went further with this car with independent than what we did, but Joe wanted to go ahead and throw this thing in there and get it rolling. Unlike a solid axle car, this would be an independent rear suspension car called IRS. You got a bunch of moving parts. You got CV axles that bend and twist and turn at both ends, the tire side and the diff side. You got your lower control arm and your upper control arm that move up and down along with your coil or your coil over that also squats or compresses or extends depending on what you're doing you know you got slicks on the car you want all the weight transfer to go to the rear you don't just have your coil or your coil over compressing so you got your lower control arm and your upper control arm your whole suspension is moving along with the coil or the coil over you know, there's a lot of fast people out there with independent rear suspensions, but at that same time, going with higher horsepower, your CV axles are a big downfall to that because strength, you know, if you're, you're putting a lot of load behind launching the car at, you know, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 RPM, um, depending on if you got a turbo or blower car, that's a lot of stress on joints like that. It's harder to go fast in these cars than it is a solid axle car. So he wanted to go ahead and switch over to the solid axle and uh, get rid of all this junk that breaks. See somebody relaunching from a line, they quickly take off and then the nose dives down because they ain't got no power. Well, a lot of stuff can happen, but you probably broke an axle. So let's go look at the good stuff. Solid axle cars. You got a lot less that you can break. So Joey's car, when we first built this rear end, we had 35 spline gun drilled axles in the housing and getting the setup close to where we needed it. We were tire shaking a lot. countless times and broken an axle on the driver's side. So then he went with 35 spline solid axles. So since then, we've learned a lot from suspension changes and shock changes and whatnot. So we haven't shaken the tire like that, like we used to. You can adjust your pinion angle with your four link bars. Um, I'm sure you could probably do the same thing with the IRS setup, but it's a lot more intense and you got to have definitely something aftermarket in order to change that because they don't, they're, you can't change them from factory. A lot less moving parts on this one. Um, a lot more adjustability. You know, on this car, we've got it separating and set up to separate, but at the same time, if we wanted to, we could always 
put slicks on the car and make it squat. Um, squat, you want, you know, 100% anti-squat or less. That way the car will squat. And when you take off the line, you know, obviously you'll get a lot of weight transfer back. You'll hit the tire harder in the back because of the body wanting to shift backwards. Um, instead of the way we have it separating, the body actually picks up off of the axle and shoots forward. Uh, we got a pretty good video of that on this last run. It, it separated pretty daggum good. You know, you got your four links on the front side, top and bottom. Um, and what we're going for is anywhere between possibly 130 to 150, 160% anti squat. That way we get it separating quick, hit the tire hard, and go and take off. So, what that does is if I went down one hole, or two holes or three holes on this bar, it's basically changing your anti-squat numbers, which it, what anti-squat is, is it's a percentage of where your bars come and meet up into the car. So all that is a bunch of math off of, you know, center of gravity, wheelbase, ride height. There's a bunch of calculations that go into what your anti-squat numbers are and where your center of gravity point is. But where your lower and your upper meet each other in the center of the car or wherever it meets, wherever they intersect, that is your anti-squat line, your instant center line. So let's just say we move this down, this hole down one, and the top stays the same. That would increase where let's just say our instant center line our instant center point was about right here where they intersect you know we move that bar down one it'll lengthen it which in turn makes the rear end separate slower your anti-squat would go down in percentage um, all those variables are a matter of how you want the car set up um, same thing goes for if we pick this bar up one hole, the anti-squat percentage would raise because you're making your instant center point on the car shorter and higher. So all the math goes into where your instant center and your anti-squat number percentage is. Anything above 100%, you are separating the car. Anything below 100% and you're pretty much squatting the car because of where your instant center line is. And like I said, it goes on where your center of gravity is, which is most most of the time where your camshaft height is. Uh, wheelbase has a lot to do with it. So if you have a short pivot and it's short and high, you know, depending on how much anti-squat you have in the car, it all depends on where your instant center point is. It'll react quick or react slow. Um, what we have learned is your wishbone right here. It centers your axle, of course, but the pivot point, this is your pivot point right here. Um, we need to go ahead and take this point and move it to the axle side. If these two points right here were moved to the frame side, basically what that does is when you make any kind of adjustments on the four link, bottom two lower bars are your wheelbase. You want to get your wheelbase right with one upper bar off, get your wheelbase right with your lower bars, and then do your pinion angle with your either upper right or upper left bar. And after you set your pinion angle at what you want, you'll either set negative or positive preload on your upper bar on this side. And basically all that does is, uh, let's just say your car is going to the left or the, to the right, depending on how much power your car has got, you could either put negative or positive preload in your upper bar and change. Once you launch, if that car goes to the left or right, you can give it some negative or positive preload and it'll make it go straight, depending on how your setup is, if you have everything right. When the car takes off, all your weight is being transferred to your right rear. So it won't go left. 
So if you want to straighten that up, you would put some negative preload in to make that bar longer to shift that axle a little bit over and give it some preload on the right rear to basically when you launch, it's already got the preload that it doesn't want to push the car to the left. It'll stay planted and push the car straight. We need to put the pivot point on the axle from what we learned because if your two, your main two mounting points are on the frame side, once you adjust all your four link points, once the pivot points on the axle, you don't have to adjust your wishbone again. So on another point of the difference between IRS and solid axle, um, radials versus slicks. You know, if you have a slick car, you want it to squat and hit the tire as much as possible and put all the weight on it you can. On a radial, you want to do the opposite and separate the car. So with that entailed, your shocks get set up differently. So right now, Joey's car has about, let's say, I think it is three quarters of an inch to inch and a quarter of shaft showing. So this is a five inch shock. So you got an inch and a quarter, three quarters inch and a quarter of shock shaft showing. So all that shaft is shoved in the shock. So when he's driving down the road, you know, he's got three quarters to an inch and a quarter of shock that could squat and just have a little bit of play. But when he's on the strip, you know, when he hits it and leaves the line, all that shock, that all the stem that's in the shock is gonna to want to extend and move out. But on independent rear suspension cars and you want squat, basically you're gonna to wanna to have a shock kinda of look like this. So you might want to have a little bit of stem in the shock body versus a lot of it in the shock body with this setup. So when you're squatting and you take off, Let's just reverse the theory on this. If you have an inch to an inch and three quarter in the shock body and you want it to squat, you can squat, you know, four inches or so. You need to keep that tire planted, not shove them back up in the car to where it unsettles the car to a certain extent and uh, get it rolling down the track. But we're learning, got a lot to learn still and can never stop learning. So it's always, always gonna be that, uh, Go on that extra mile, try to get faster. So next go around, we'll probably end up having a new, more adjustable frame inside the car. And new rear end setup, which will have, I think Joey's got 15 by 12s on a deeper dish. So the back space is a lot less than what these are. So look a lot better. A lot more adjustability. Shouldn't have any rear end problems out of the other one or this one now. You just gotta get the motor right. That's that. All right, car 194.